Good morning. Thank you, Lee. And I'm sorry, I did not remember. Nicole. Nicole. Yeah. I, I didn't memorize your name. Sorry about that. Um, there's going to be a lot of bad jokes about memory, if I can remember any. If I can remember any. Um, thank you, thank you, uh, Office of Employee Assistance, for hosting this. It's a lot of fun for me to be able to do this. Um, it's very different than my day-to-day -day kind of clinical work. Um, and so um, let, me, let me just start. My name is Gordon Hertz. I'm a psychologist in private practice on the west side of Madison. I, I, I'd like to um, say that's what the view looks like from my office. It doesn't. That's where I go when I try to get away from the office. I'm afraid the view is going to start looking like this pretty soon, which is actually this. I took this out the window of my office. About five years ago, UW-Madison shut down with a two-day snow. Remember that? Um, it was the first time the campus shut down. It was right during finals week. That's what I, I made it to my office the day at the Friday after, and that's what it looked like from there. Um, I've been in practice, full-time private practice since 2000. Before that, I was uh, director of neuropsychology services at one of the hospitals here in Madison. Um, I, my specialty is neuropsychology. It's one of the specialties I work with, and which means that I do a lot of evaluation and treatment for people with brain-related conditions, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, head injury, brain tumors that affect mental and cognitive and personality functioning. So I see a lot of folks with brain-related conditions. What's a lot of fun about this kind of work is that I get to talk about normal memory functioning, what's normal, uh, and um, how to tell the difference between uh, what, can, what can go wrong with normal memory versus maybe how to tell a little bit when someone may be having some memory problems that, that maybe uh, should be evaluated more than that. But invariably, when I'm doing evaluations of people, particularly people where there's suspected um, dementia, suspected Alzheimer's disease, they're starting to have some slippage. Do evaluations, inevitably someone from the family will take me aside and say something like, uh, I came out of the mall the other day and I forgot where I parked my car and that's the second time it's happened this month. Am I okay? Is it, is it, does, it mean, does it mean something is going on? So it, uh, invariably, um, I think a lot of people are concerned about memory functioning and what it may mean. So I do a, a lot of reassurance, and one of the things we're gonna, that I have is a quick test that everybody in the room can take uh, for yourselves and, and get an idea of how to tell the difference between memory problems that are normal and memory problems that may be a little bit different than that. Um, this, one of the things that I'll, that I'll uh, talk about is that cognitive abilities and memory in particular um, are very, have, should be, in order to work well, should be active, um, active cognitive skills. One of the misconceptions that I think that a lot of us have about memory is that, well, it ought to work as well as it always has. It ought to, it ought to work, you know, ongoing without having to do anything for it. It ought to just work automatically as I'm doing things. As I'm mingling around a room, I ought to automat kind of be able to memorize people's names. I ought, to ha I ought to remember who the person was in that movie that I love, but I can't remember the name. It's as if we um, uh, take it for granted. It, memory especially works best when there's, when there's active participation, when it's done uh, mindfully and in, intentionally. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So that said, what I really hope is that um, please uh, don't w wait till the end. If you have a question that comes up with something that I'm talking about, please raise your hand. And I, I would prefer to do it that way because I'd rather kind of have this be a little, a little interactive and, uh, and really respond to things that come up for people as, as we're talking about that. So please, so please do that. Um, I, um, I'm going to my notes are my slideshow, so I'm going to work from notes. There's no way I had, had this all memorized. Everybody's probably heard this quote before. They may not forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Um, attributed to Maya Angelou and, of course, uh, 
internet's got too much information, it may or may not go back differently than that, but it signals a very important feature of the way memory works and something that you can use to your advantage. If memory has an emotional stamp on it, that helps encode it, that helps, that helps solidify it. So um, sometimes that happens in passing. Sometimes an event happens and, uh, for example, it's a, it's a horrific, it's a traumatic event and there's an emotional stamp on that memory and if it's incredibly intense that's how that you know that's related to PTSD in a sense post-traumatic stress because the emotional stamp is so intense that interacts with the with the neurochemicals and the brain structures and it helps stamp in that memory that's something you can use and and add when especially you encounter information, this is something I really need to commit to memory um, to help yourself do that, to help, help, uh, uh, help it sink in uh, more strongly. That will also get to, I'm going to talk about stages of memory, that will also help with retrieval. How do you do that? The different phases of the way memory works. So I'm going to talk about healthy, uh, healthy memory, how to keep memory and cognitive functioning healthy. Uh, in general, Th this, none of this will be surprising, but it, I don't think, but it will um, hopefully uh, solidify some things that you may have already heard. Uh, how to help someone you know who you think may be having some memory difficulties. Um, and then hopefully, uh, you know, in, purposely, we're going to get to some practice, some techniques to practice. And I hope I hope that's going to be interactive. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty, you know, pretty one-sided. Me trying to memorize a list of things that people give me. But um, sometimes I start these out and ask people, how many things do you think you could memorize right now? And go through a, an exercise of memorizing ten things. It's not as hard as you think if you do it if you do it with some some techniques. We'll talk a little bit about memory theory. What um, uh, not. Uh, brain structures and those kinds of things because I haven't committed all of that to memory and the field is changing unbelievably uh, unbelievably rapidly in terms of what we know about hem how memory works where the structures are where the processes are that's interesting it's fascinating but it's less um, useful I think for how to do it how to do it well and then we'll practice. So memory health. It turns out that there, when you look at the recent literature, there actually is some consensus developing about what works, how to keep cognitively healthy as we age. Um, so I'm going to just mention two 2008 and 2010 expert consensus statements. The National Institutes of Health looked at all of these factors. They looked at the scientific literature and they looked at diet, nutrition, medications, social and cognitive engagement. You often hear if you're socially connected and interactive, it's better for brain health than if you're isolated. They looked at, at all the literature and all of these factors, uh, including genetic factors. And there, there are genetic loading factors for things like Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm, uh, you'll hear, I'll flip back and forth at times between brain conditions like Alzheimer's disease and normal memory functioning. So if that gets confusing, stop me and let me know. Um, but in terms of what is pretty well agreed on uh, can help physical activity, and, and other leisure activities. Now, there's a huge amount of research coming out these days about, you've probably heard about this, about aerobic exercise, uh, especially in brain health. Aerobic exercise increases blood flow, it helps support uh, vascular systems in the brain, and it absolutely can help uh, slow normal cognitive changes in, in, as we age. Um, but other, other leisure activities, again, this idea of linking in with other things that are mentally stimulating, um, ha actually have been shown in some fairly good research to be effective in supporting brain health. Um, 
limited but inconsistent evidence in terms of cognitive activities. People say, oh, I love doing Sudoku, I do crossword puzzles all the time, I'm playing, my, I'm playing Candy Crush two hours a day, doesn't that help? Um, limited evidence, but there's some evidence that, that those kinds of activities may help. Things that contribute to decline in old, older years, in, in aging. Loss of a spouse uh, is a very important marker for a lot of folks that you can see a drop off in cognition, uh, which may rebound depending on other kind of uh, uh, stabilizing factors. Depression is a consistent, it consistently correlates with, um, with reductions in cognitive functioning. And often when I'm seeing folks to evaluate for memory, for example, it's essential to do an assessment of uh, whether the person is depressed or not, or anxious or not, because clearly those mood factors will affect memory functioning for better or for, for worse. Um, which means that one of the things that can be done, one of the essential factors of maintaining brain health is paying attention to emotions, paying attention to mood, especially moods that persist and persistently interfere with functioning. Um, there are a lot of inconsistent or insufficient findings at this point. And part of the problem is, is that the research is relatively young in the sense that the question is posed in terms of if you start engaging in some of these activities when you're 60, how does it affect, affect you when you're 85? And does that change the trajectory? We haven't studied, there hasn't been enough studies yet of large samples of community dwelling older adults, uh, longevity type of studies to really have a good sense of that. You'll notice um, National Institutes of Health uh, prescribed pharmaceutical agents or dietary supplements to prevent decline or Alzheimer's disease. This is in, in illnesses, in diseases, uh, not insufficient evidence. So you hear that there are two or three medications on the market that, that slow cognitive decline in, in folks with Alzheimer's type dementias. It can slow cognitive decline, but the evidence really isn't great yet about, again, over the course of a lifespan, wh how, how, much does it, how much does it slow that kind of cognitive decline. Um, the Stanford consensus statement found reason for optimism, and here's one thing that's happening as cohorts as the population ages and cohorts of people live into their 80s and more, you know, I, I think 80s and up is one of the largest growing demographics in terms of age groups at this point. Uh, I have a couple of folks on my uh, client, a couple of clients I see are over 100 right now, which I never did uh, 15 years ago. Um, but brain health seems to be getting better by population as, as the population moves through its age group. Dietary supplements like ginkgo biloba, you hear a lot about that, and other dietary supplements, there really has not been enough good research to, to show, uh, to talk about that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, brain training, cognitive software. Very limited evidence of improvement in daily life, and I'll have some more to say about that. Um, in fact, let me, let me go to that um, uh, in terms of memory training programs. It's a huge market on the order of low billion dollar market these days in terms of selling brain training programs and cognitive software. Um, 19, oh gosh, 30 years ago. Uh, there was new, this is, was uh, my dissertation research. I'm old enough to remember when some of the original uh, personal computer software programs came out. Uh, and so um, I got interested in that. I was working with uh, people with traumatic brain injuries at that time and uh, got the idea, let's, let's study whether this works or not. We had a sample of, I, 
forget how, no, I don't. It was, a, it, was a small, it was a small group. It was an N of six, I think, because it was relatively new research at the time. Um, people with traumatic brain injuries with memory impairment got to train on cognitive software designed for memory functioning f until they plateaued on, uh, on memory activities, until they stopped improving. They had testing before they started the training and testing after they finished the training. Um, they certainly got better on the, cogn on the computer tasks. There was very little change on the testing at time two related to time one. So, um, and, so, and that's the kind of finding that you get in, in some of the research that's out there. More than that, that um, improved, so that kind of study shows improvement on the task itself. You know, you play a video game, you get better on it. Uh, you do any activity enough and you get better on it. That's learning. Um, improvement on a related task, we did not even try that secondary improvement. Did we give the people um, other memory tasks and see if it transferred? The third type of proof, which is whether training transfers to actual real world functioning, there's very little research on that and, and, and very little research show, demonstrating any kind of ecological validity. So um, uh, I think I'm going to go back. I'll say this, although we'll get to the slide later. Um, how to be a smart consumer about software packages, for example. Um, is to uh, is to ask what evidence do they have behind it that it that it transfers to real world functioning when i do memory training cl clinical memory training i always ask the person to bring in tell me a a, a a real world activity where your memory breaks down and let's figure out some workarounds for that. This is the difference between doing memory drills and hoping that that transfers to something that you really want to do in the real world versus starting the other w way. What's not working and what can we do? Sometimes that involves memorization type of activities to strengthen abilities, but more often than not, it includes uh, um, targeted tasks that are going to help the person functionally do what they want to do uh, in, in the real world. I do a lot, I do talks for uh, older adult communities in town. Madison has got fantastic support services for older adults, including uh, residential communities with all levels of care, from independent to uh, memory care. Uh, uh, Units. I'm going to tell. Uh, I'm going to tell a bad joke. I'm giving you a, a, warn, a warning. When I when I talk to when I talk to these groups, I uh, I tell them as we get older, it's a time where we start to think more about the hereafter, which is defined by going from one room to another and saying, "What the heck am I here after?" <laughs> uh, oh, it's so. It, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was, it's, but. Um, that is a normal memory lapse. And actually, that may not even be related to memory. It may have to do with uh, actually what you'd call very short-term memory or even attention. Um, nobody looks up. It, it's, it's the time span between encoding information, putting information there, and, and walking 20 feet to another room and needing to retrieve it. So. In, in that time span, a whole bunch of other stuff has happened, which has been distracting. Now, what's the best way to compensate for that? Go back to the room where you were, right? And, 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 and all of a sudden, oh yeah, I needed to, I needed to, I was gonna go look at the, the TV guide to see what was on, what time my show's on tonight. Why does that work? That works because an important thing, an important way that memory works is by context, by association, by contextual cues. So this can help you when you lay down new memories, when you say to yourself, this is something I really need to memorize. Build in context, where are you? Uh, 
um, physically, what's your position? Are you sitting, standing? Are you active? Who else is there? Room cues. All of those cues help not an emotional stamp so much, but a contextual cues, associations. Those associations do two things. They help strengthen the encoding, the original putting down of the memory, because it's networked into a whole bunch of other cues, not just one fact. It also helps with retrieval, with bringing it back, because when you say, what did I want to go into the living room for? You can ask yourself, what, where was I standing at the time I made the decision? What was I thinking about? You can use those context cues as links in to the piece of information you want to retrieve. So it helps with strengthening and coding, and it helps with retrieval, at least those two portions. Does that make sense? Is that, is that? So we're, gonna tr we're actually going to try a technique that will help you like that. Now, memory normal or something more. So everybody has uh, tip of the tongue experiences or, or those experiences of where did I put my glasses down? Uh, I remembered there was something I wanted to do and I can't re do it. I can't remember what it was. Tip of the tongue kind of, I know that word, but I can't think of it. I know that actor's name, but I can't think of it. Um, about five or six are normal when you study community dwelling. Uh, older adults or middle-aged adults um, or young adults. I'm, I don't know, I'm not put age, age categories on, on myself or anybody, but um, five or six of those a week are average when you, normal, normal functioning. So it's not just statistically, if those start to occur, it's not, um, it's not a thing to be alarmed about. What matters is this, when you finally remember the piece of information that you wanted to, or where that object is, or what you wanted to go in the room for. Do you remember how you got, the, do you remember how the keys got to a counter that you never put them on? Or do you still not remember that, that context? And that context, by the way, is a different type of memory, which is uh, what is called ep episodic memory, which is memory for events. Uh, memory for sequences of information. How did that happen? Um, if the person still doesn't remember how that happened, uh, chances are about 95% that if you remember the sequence, what happened, that that's a normal memory gap. People with early Alzheimer's or other dementias tend not to even be able to remember that that episode, that episodic, that kind of context. So that's a quick way, uh, and in fact, it, it, th those kinds of memory lapses, being able to remember that kind of context versus not, really uh, are related to different brain areas that are affected by um, progressive dementias versus that are uh, affected by normal memory or inattention. Um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to raise their hand or say. I'm just. I'm curious if people. Uh, yeah. So yes. In a situation where, say, I've been in a situation where I'm in charge of like merchandising at a concert, and I have 18 different stands of merchandise, and I am have masking tape in one hand and a pen in the other hand, and and money bags, and I am going here and there and here and I'm putting up, you know, putting up, I mean, in 30 minutes I might do that action, you know, a thousand times, and then at the end of the night I'm like, where are my keys? So yeah, I'll find them somewhere in the trail, but do I specifically remember putting them there? No, because I was, you know, I'm sure I did, but the actual act of putting it down there, no. Is that still? It, it sounds like, it, it sounds like information overload. It sounds like so much happened in between the original event and, 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 and trying to remember how the heck did they get there, that that may bump out that more short-term short -term memory. So that, that, that's, that's, a way that, that's a way that can happen. Um, <laughs> the fact that, they, that, that I found them by backtracking makes sense, but the actual act of putting it at that table or in that corner or whatever, 
uh, part of that, that's a great example of um, doing something automatically, setting them down. You're in the middle of four different things. You set them down. You're not stamping that event with any particular meaning. That, it, that can kind of be a, an attention or an intentional, a, a, a gap in intentionally laying down that memory. It, it's, all, it's almost automatic. So it, it gets wiped out. One of the things, I ha have some slides. I don't know that we'll get to them, but one of the things that I talk about is that one of the ways to think about memory is that part of its function actually is to get rid of things that we don't need. Um, we think that memory um, um, operates automatically and records everything we do. One of the books that I will recommend uh, on, on the reference list is called The Mind of a Mnemonist, M N. E M O, I can't spell it. Mnemonics is the science of memory. Um, but this was a case study by a Russian neuropsychologist of a person who had, you know, that photographic memory, memory that memorized everything automatically. And when this neuropsych, it sounds like a, fa a boy, would I like to be able to remember everything? N not necessarily. Are there things you'd like to get rid of? Um, this is another normal memory error, is that error of um, uh, persistence. Sometimes memories stick and we don't want them to. Uh, so that's, another, that's another, uh, uh, another thing that can go wrong with normal memory functioning. So um, memory if it supposed if it functions to get rid of things that we don't need the counter the important counterbalance to that is to be aware at the moment again this is something i need to commit to memory um, remember memory impairment other than normal memory dysfunction has to show a pattern over time uh, once or twice misplacing the keys or forgetting somebody's name who you haven't seen in two years is, is not necessarily a pattern. It also, in order to become a diagnosable condition, has to affect the person's social functioning or their occupational functioning. If everybody in this room is functioning effectively in, in the workplace, uh, it's not, in, in any of the gaps that we have are not rising to the level of being a potential condition. Uh, folks are, are functional. Um, anybody n know people they're concerned about, have parents or uh, um, folks that they're concerned about memory functioning? So um, I don't know if people have things that they would say about how they how they try to help or what they try to do. But for people with memory impairment especially, it's important to be an advocate for that person and go with them to doctors and uh, visits. They may not remember to report that problem. They may be, a person may be embarrassed about it. Uh, and they may, um, uh, they may not remember what they're told about it. So to have that external person there is essential. I'm going to put a little plug in for what I do professionally, but you can get superb neuropsychological assessment services in, in Madison. Um, there, is, uh, there are screening tests. A well-known political figure recently passed a mental status screening test with flying colors. Remember that? You know what I'm referring to? Um, screening tests are done in a couple of minutes and um, are, can be sensitive to cognitive dysfunction, but not specific, by which I mean they don't say, yes, this is a brain-related condition. They may say, yep, person can't remember three words after five minutes. But what, uh, I'll tell you, actually, what, I've diagnosed three 
urinary tract infections over the course of seeing people with mental status screening tests because people's attention is off, they're distracted, they feel crummy, they're running a low-grade fever, and they're not paying attention to the memory items, so they, they perform low, but it doesn't necessarily mean a brain-related condition. That's why a, a good, thorough neuropsychological assessment is... Yes, yeah, someone had a comment or question. Uh, I, I don't know necessarily about Florida in, in particular. Florida in general has, I think, really good services for older adults um, because, of the dem because of the demographics. The, uh, in Madison has a uh, coalition on aging, uh, which, uh, and in senior services, which, include, which can include home visits, going and checking on, uh, on seniors in, in their homes. There probably are things like that uh, there locally. I would look up, uh, uh, if you, actually if you call the Dane County Coalition on Aging, they may know, they may know offices where, where your family member is, yes. Well, uh, it, that sounds, that, that could get more into, um, I mean, there are a lot of reasons a person could, could do that. They may, He's 80-some years old. Um, they, you know, they may be anxious in the moment and trying to fill, fill a silence and reverting to something familiar. So it could, it could be anxiety. It could be that they don't remember having said it before, which, which could be a signal of, of uh, memory concern. Um, and so it, that sounds like it sounds like something potentially to get checked out, is is what I would think. Um, it's it's not uncommon to uh, for people with memory impairment to repeat uh, because it's familiar and it's in, in ingrained. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, there, there is a good, a good technique for that. Um, face name learning, person name learning is one of the most common th uh, things people ha ha have challenges with and uh, is something that is very important for us to do. 24 is a, a, a kind of a, upper high, a high limit on pieces of information. but. The, the method that I would use that, that actually is kind of a proven technique that, that works is, and especially for meeting new people, but you could apply this to people you know, is look at the person, um, pick out something distinctive about their appearance, not necessarily uh, something about their face, something distinctive <laughs> that, that is memorable, that you will remember, and try to form an association between that feature and their name. Um, so again, it's intentional, it's forming an association, and that makes it active at the time you're trying to lay down that memory, and it also gives you a route in to try to retrieve the name. Does that, does that make sense? It does, but what if you can't even remember what feature you were thinking about? <laughs> um, that's why it's, it's got to be kind of something distinctive. Um, and embarrassing mistakes happen with that. Uh, there's a lady who works down the hall from where my office is, 
And I passed her in the hall multiple times, finally decided I'm going to memorize her name. Her name is Sandy. I don't know if we have any Sandys in the room. Um, she's got sandy colored hair. I made a ridiculous, and the more ridiculous you can make the association, the better it helps. It puts that kind of fun emotional stamp on it. Um, she, had sand, she has sandy colored hair. Well, I have to catch myself because, and, and so, I, so I made the association between her sandy colored hair and her name, Sandy. Um, and sand and beach, I have to stop myself from calling her pebbles when, <laughs> when I walk by because that's, that's where my association goes to. So stuff like that can happen. But it, uh, you see, the handout that I gave, and if, by the way, if there weren't enough copies, please let me know, I'll get, get copies for people. Any of these techniques will feel um, artificial, they'll feel awkward um, when, you're, when you're trying these. Uh, but it can get built in. If you, uh, really, if you're looking at one of the nieces or nephews, did you say, you can't, uh, there's n nothing distinctive about them that, that in particular um, that you could pick out? 24? <laughs> <laughs> I have two kids and two dogs, all with the letter J, and I got confused with my own kids. And who's the dog's name? Well, my, my wife, says, my wife comes from a family of six siblings, and she says for the first three years of her life, she thought her name was Elaine, Mar Elaine Mary, Peter, Ron, <laughs> and a couple other, and uh, you know, a couple other of the kids' names, all strung together. So mom and dad, they would call out the, all the string of names, and that would be, you know, because they, they didn't necessarily have the, na the name right at hand. It takes, pr it takes practice, and it will feel artificial. <laughs> but uh, these techniques can get built in. Um, I'm aware of the time, I had more information, but I absolutely want to practice a couple of, uh, a couple of things. <clears throat> and this gets to memorizing, memorizing information. Um, have, has everybody, have people heard of the PEG method? This is, this is an, association, an association method. Um, let's, let's do this. Um, so, uh, if you're going home, what's typical for you? How many things do you have to remember to stop and do on the way home or pick up? Three, four things? More than that? <laughs> Let me be like three things or something. Let's just try, let's just try a, sh a short list. Um, give me something that rhymes with one. None. None. Uh, Give me something that rhymes with two. Boo. Boo? Mm -hmm. How about something that rhymes with three? Three. Uh, none, boo, and tree. OK. Those are your pegs. None, one, boo, two, tree, three. Now, the first time I ever learned this, I did, you can do this with a lit, an, you create your pegs. You can create up to 10 pegs. So one, tell me something you have to, you have to do on the way home from work tonight. Put gas in the car. Say again? Put gas in the car. Okay, so one is none. What's your association between none and put gas in the car? What do you have to do when you get back to the office this afternoon? Or get back to your workplace this afternoon? Send emails. Emails. Uh, boo. Two. Make an association between boo and emails. Um, some people might not like, like receiving them. <laughs> yeah, email pops up, boo. <laughs> Do this. Um, how about uh, a third thing that you have to, you have to do this weekend? Shopping. Shopping. Tr OK. So make an association between tree, three, and shopping. Tree is like the map of stores in the shopping mall on the poster. Can you imagine a tree with all the things you got to pick up this weekend? OK. So one is none, fill the car with gas. Two is boo, scary emails. <laughs> Three is tree, 
which means, oh yeah, I gotta fill the shopping tree. I got, And so um, it only takes a couple of, again, intentional practice, practices with that. You've attached the to-do list to your peg, your built-in peg of items. Uh, and, all, and what you do and when you want to retrieve your to-do list, you go down one, none, none, no gas, I got to fill up, two, boo, I got to write those emails, three, tree, you associate the third not three with tree, which you've associated with shopping. You see how that works? You see how that works? It feels cumbersome, it feels artificial when you're practicing it, when you're building the skill, but after a while, it, it can become built in. You create your own architecture, your own pegs, structure, to attach items to. You make a ridiculous association between your items and your structure, and that, and rehearse that a bit, and I'm going to show, tell you in a minute about effective rehearsal. Uh, a lot of people think all I have to do is say it over and over again and that's going to help it sink in. That's not necessarily effective. And then it helps you with retrieval also because you've got your peg list with your associations and what you've associated it to. So it helps you again. Instead of memorizing discrete facts, you're applying facts to a cognitive structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Sorry. Ah. I apologize. Yeah. So is it I'd be lazy if I just keep my pegs the same and just change my associations. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. In fact, the next the next technique I'm gonna show is um, almost an infinite number of pegs that you already have built in. You don't even have to create this architecture. Yes. It's, I've, I've heard of a trick before, and I'm wondering if this is just the same same skill or same tool, but where you imagine all the things you have to remember, each one assigned to a room of your house, and then in your mind you walk through your house and you can do the same. Same. Kind of same. Thing. Yes. And that's exactly what I was going to talk about. So, <laughs> fantastic. In infinite rooms in my house. In, you, <laughs> you have a, a huge amount of objects, even if you've only got three rooms, you've got a huge amount of objects around those rooms. So, but, th but that's, that's a built-in architecture. Any other comments or questions? Yes? So if you did it for a month, don't you start mixing up what one was? If you're using none? <coughs> Actually, what you'll find is, holy moly, I remember what my one was from last week. You'll actually, you'll. Uh, you so that's my, and then I forget today's one. That's what I do. The, the, and, and what you're asking is, isn't that list going to get cluttered up with stuff that I put on it before? And that, that, is, that is possible, but, um, yes, but I think you'll find that when you put new objects on your, on your pegs, that it'll kind of displace what was there. <laughs> But you can create new lists. You can have a list for office. You can have a list of pegs for home, a list of pegs for weekend. And that's three pegs of X number of items that you've just put nine or 10 to do things on. Um, so we're talking numbers, can you also use like letters, A, B, C, or maybe shapes? I mean, is that something people so like, what if you have a month, it's typically about four weeks in a month, usually. So first week can be numbers, then letters, then shapes on the other one. Then you start over the next month, and by four weeks, you might have forgot about what one, two, three, four was four weeks ago, or something like that. You, know? you, could, you could do that. Um, that'd be a way to have you know, 28 or 30 things that you're remembering over the course of a month. The trick is, for, uh, for, or for letters of the alphabet, the trick is to make each of your pegs something that's built in that's easily remembered. That's why I, I've found it easiest to ha kind of have rhyming pegs. 
uh, one, you know, something that rhymes with one that's a real good visual, Im vi visual image or something like that. But whatever you use as your pegs, as long as you build that in and, and can put things on that, that, that can work. Es especially, you know, if you do tend to be more visual. Um, by the way, I wanted to show, let's see if I can, why does this work? It works because memory works by association. Um, that's, that's how we lay down new memories. At a basic biological level, an organism's trucking along and it gets out in the bright sun and it dries out and feels thirsty. And it learns there's an association between bright heat and thirst. That's biologically kind of how that works, basically. That's, how, that's learning. Uh, and so the next time, there's, there's arguments about whether we can have one trial learning. Some stuff happens and you never forget it. You put your hand on a hot stove and you never, you never forget that. Um, but the association of bright light, heat, and thirst is what makes the association and what helps the organism do things differently next time. Nobody knows associations better than marketing. Is anybody here in marketing or um, marketing or advertisers? That's why they use logos. Uh, an intense, uh, have you ever had a jingle that you can't get out of your head even though you don't use the product? Marketers know how well this works or how badly it works sometimes if you don't, if you don't wanna, uh, if you don't want to remember that item. Um, so um, making those associations is what's, going to, is what's going to help you both with encoding and retrieval. Um, do you, would, you tell us, would you tell us about that household technique? Would you say a little bit about that? Oh, um, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I was going to. Yes, and so that is, so the architecture that you have automatically built in, if I asked you, someone talk me through, someone who's willing to talk me through coming in from your garage into, you come into the garage and then you go into the house. Someone tell me about what, what their place looks like for, for that. Yes, yeah. take my shoes off, go into the kitchen, and put my shoes, walk through the living room <laughs> into the front hall closet. And then um, from the living room, there's a hallway down to the kids' room, which is next to the bathroom, which is next to the bedroom, the master bedroom. Now, how much time, perfect. Great example. How much time did you spend memorizing that? <laughs> yes, I didn't. Automatic. Mm -hmm. Automatic built in. It's there. So you don't have to memorize a peg scheme. You have a scheme like this built in. And, and, and that, by the way, that's built in by habit eventually. It's become so automatic. But you have that very actually rich cognitive scheme already built in. Similarly, you can do exactly what, what was said is place to do. Walk yourself visually through that. You walk in, there's a stairway down or another room, another door to. Kitchen. kitchen. So, first of all, if you, you're walking, I have had people learn to place objects on a, on a stairwell, on stairs. I, I bet if I ask you how many stairs do you have, you might not know. 
but if you but if you had 12 stairs, it would be possible to use just that image uh, as um, as your holders, your placeholders for to do or for for object or, or for uh, things to remember. That's an incredibly rich scheme that's automatically built in. You don't have to memorize that, but you can use that. Uh, I think one of the one of the rules of thumb that I like to give is don't memorize more than you need to. It's okay. It's okay to use external cues. People ask me, well, why do why should I memorize a shopping list? Can't I just stick a post-it on the dashboard? Sure, you can, but Remember, uh, uh, but the only app you're carrying around is your brain at the time. You don't have post-its. You forget to write it down on the post-it or put it on the dashboard. Or the classic one, uh, tie a string around your finger. Nobody actually does that. But did you ever hear people say, I got a string on my finger, but I can't remember what the heck it's for? Um, so your, your, um, your cues need to be relevant at the time you, at the time you use them. Yeah. Yes? That was exactly my question. You're not suggesting that I give up my lists, are you? Just use this as a way to keep my memory active and on top of things. If you take away my lists, I'm totally going to creep out. <laughs> uh, I'm not su absolutely not suggesting take away your lists. Um, uh, uh, a matter of fact, uh, uh, what, I, I, what I started to say is I think you'll find that there are only half a dozen things you've got to remember at the moment on the fly. And so you, it's not a, a huge volume of information. And these kinds of techniques can help you do that um, fairly readily. Um, I, I will tell you, though, of course, uh, making lists, I hope you have a system that works for you. I've gone into folks' apartments with who have memory impairment, have a condition that's affecting their memory, and they've got post-its everywhere, on the fridge, on the dining room table, on the, on the uh, uh, arms of the couch, and, and everywhere, and it's, it's disorganized. So there's a list there from uh, June that said, be sure to pay the energy bill that's four months old, for example. So having, having it structured and organized makes a lot of difference. Any other? Yes? Um, you had mentioned um, effective rehearsal, and I was curious about that. Um, how much time do we have? I thought. Uh, I think we're the, over. The, the, OK, that's great. That's great. I'm glad for the question. Um, yes. There is, let me see if I can get to this slide. There is a normal memory. One of the things I told you, memory is structured so that it gets rid of things we don't need. In fact, there's a normal forgetting curve. When you commit information to memory, who hasn't taken a test that you crammed for the night before and two days later, it's gone. Um, memory helps get rid of things. So this is called spaced retrieval or spaced rehearsal. Remember I said that just repeating things over and over again is not necessarily effective. It's like looking up a phone number and saying it to yourself four or five times as you're going to dial the phone. You may remember it at, dial the phone. Does anybody dial a phone anymore? Um, you may remember it until you dial a phone and then it's gone. Now, that's, that's, we think about that as short-term memory. But actually, it's even shorter than that. That is almost, uh, that, uh, that is a, a very brief uh, attention. That's not encoded at all. If for, that doesn't make it into long-term memory. If you're going to forget information normally, um, what you do is spaced rehearsal. Commit something to memory, or you know, memorize a piece of information, and then a minute later, say it out loud to yourself again, and then uh, space it out two minutes, and keep increasing the length of time between when you rehearse it. Um, and what that does 
is, is this. If you can imagine that, let's say, let's say this is how quickly you're forgetting information, normal memory forgetting. If you rehearse it at time one, you may remember 80% of, of it. So in, you're already beating what your normal forgetting would be. If you rehearse it at time two, you, you may be forgetting, but you may, only rem but you may remember 70%. So you are on a forgetting curve, but you're forgetting because you're rehearsing it further and further out. Say at, say at a week, you rehearse it for yourself, and you only remember half of it, whereas your normal forgetting curve would have been at, at one level, you have capitalized on your rehearsal by spaced retrieval. So that, that's what I mean by that. Gradually increase, and I think that's on the handout, gradually increase the length of time between which you bring it back to yourself. And that will, that will help solidify it. It helps with, it helps consolidate the information in a different way. You're counteracting what would be your normal forgetting. You're still on a forgetting curve. That's normal. But the um, ultimate amount you've got is better than if you, it, it, than just that, just repetition, uh, which is going to be very fleeting in terms of solidly encoding it, and you're still, oh, I'm getting the high sign there. Can we take one more question? Sure. Oh, need to leave you oh there you go. Let me, let me, this might be I was going to just say, um, I have some contact information, or I will absolutely give Lee and the office contact information. If you have any more questions, concerns, anything like that, please feel free to. Yeah. Looks like someone had a reaction to that. Or, or, oh, no, different oh. question. Uh, about the materials, you uh -huh. that book, do you have like, any others? Yes. Um, and I can, again, I can send this out for you. Um, I'll leave this up for you to take a look at. Um, there actually is a theory about sleep that it helps us consolidate, process and consolidate information. Um, you're not hitting save or something. You're not hitting save. Um, Best I could tell you would be to sleep is extremely important. Getting enough sleep is extremely important in day-to-day -day memory functioning and cognitive functioning generally. Best I could tell you would be maybe try to rehearse it before you fall asleep. Um, in fact, a good way to do that is to play the day back. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, Maybe that's one example where it's a good thing that memory gets rid of stuff that we, <laughs> we don't want to persist. I don't want to be thinking about spreadsheets while I'm, I don't want to be dreaming about spreadsheets while. Can you tell us what um, method um, wait staff people use to, they memorize the whole menu and then they come to your table and there's six people and I want my steak medium rare and she wants her steak with this and so and so wants this side and swapped out instead of that side and then the wait, they go to leave and then you're like, oh wait, I changed my drink order to this and they memorize it and they get distracted by the next table and three other things and yet the orders are correct. How do they do that? Um, how they memorize a menu that changes day to day I don't know. That'd be an interesting study to ask, how do you do that? Um, but some people seem to be able to do that. How they get the drink orders and changing, they write it down. No, like oh, a lot of places, they don't even allow, they don't allow that. Oh. So they're literally somehow getting it all in their memory. It's just, yeah, it's That's Sandy or it's Sandy. Like, uh, really? Yeah, like, yeah. Because I've had to do that before. And without even really thinking about it, just like, okay, I remember someone for their voice and then connect their order to that. Wow. So did you learn that or did you yeah. come up with that on your own or? We came up with it because you just had to remember it. That was just like survival. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be able to remember dialogue in a play. 
memorize dialogue. I couldn't do that anymore. Thank you. I hope it was I hope it was memorable in a good way, in a good way.